Hey there, welcome to FOMO Sapiens. This is another of our special best of shows featuring female FOMO Sapiens. And today, oh, such a good one, Kathy Heller. So Kathy Heller is somebody who I first encountered because she has a podcast, a podcast that is very good. It's called Don't Keep Your Day Job, which I, I just really like her style. Basically, she's somebody who is a, a songwriter and a singer, and she used her skills and some creativity to create a whole career where she was able to monetize that in a real way. She ended up writing a book about that and sharing the lessons of her podcast, and she's had tons of good people on. But more than that, she's just cool. She's just a cool person, and she's done really amazing things. And so I think what, what I like about her, and in, in this show, we're going to talk about her book that came out last year is sort of like, how do you take your skills and talents and turn them into something, a business? How do you monetize them? And I think that's always really hard to do. And so she just makes it really clear. That's what I like about her work. And another friend of the show, Dory Clark, has a great book called Entrepreneurial You that also is about this. When I read Dory's book, I had my, I think I was like highlighting every page, but these two thinkers, they get into sort of like, how can people you, me, our friends, our families, just like figure out what we're good at and then get paid to be who we are, which is kind of like the ultimate, right? And so you're going to love Kathy. The other thing is she's just cool. Uh, she's she's very LA, which is you know, like, it's like a New York person like me and an LA person like her. You think we wouldn't get along, but no, we get along very well. So listen to the show and share this one with somebody who might enjoy it because I just think that the way Kathy kind of does her work and the the very sort of accessible, practical messages she gives are, are special. So I hope you enjoy the show and I will see you next week. FOMO. I think that we live in a really interesting world where people voluntarily choose to spend most of their time doing things they don't like. It's kind of fascinating because we can choose. There's an expansiveness to what's possible. And we can create a new possibility that maybe we don't have to save up our happiness for the weekends and retirement. Like maybe there's a way for you to be a part of this thing you love in a, just a more creative way. That's Kathy Heller, the host of the hit podcast, Don't Keep Your Day Job, and the soon-to-be-released book of the same name. I'm your host, Patrick McGinnis, and this is FOMO Sapiens, part of the HBR Presents Network. Allow me to introduce myself. I'm the guy who invented the term FOMO. That's short for fear of missing out. Today, FOMO is an epidemic and is changing us so much that it sort of feels like we're evolving into a new species. But FOMO doesn't have to take over your life. You can find the power to choose what you actually want and the courage to miss out on the rest. I'll show you how right here on FOMO Sapiens. FOMO. FOMO. Welcome to FOMO Sapiens, the show where I interview people who are changing the world and ask them how they choose from among the many opportunities and options in their busy lives. Everybody has that talent or passion, the one that makes them think, if I didn't have to worry about money, I would do this full time. It's a romantic notion. Whether you like to build furniture, bake, do photography, or write music, the idea of leaving behind the cubicle or the office and launching a new career can be the ultimate daydream. But does it have to remain a daydream? Could you actually make a living out of doing what you love? So a lot of people will tell you, yes, go for it. But it's easier said than done. Say you quit your job to pursue a passion and things don't go as you expect. The place you don't want to end up is stressed, worrying about where your next paycheck is and mired in regret. Today's guest will give us a roadmap and the tools to explore how you might pursue a passion full time. Kathy Heller once struggled with this same set of issues and then found a way to launch a lucrative career writing music for television shows. She then parlayed that into a multi-dimensional seven-figure career in the creative economy. On her podcast and in her new book, she is on a mission to help others to do exactly the same so that they can find purpose and get paid all at the same time. And stick around till the end for the full moment of the show where I'll be talking to an entrepreneur who used his day job to move to Brazil and eventually launched what has become a huge entrepreneurial venture. So if you've ever wanted to move abroad and start your own thing, you're definitely going to want to check that out. Joining me on the line from Los Angeles is Kathy Heller. Kathy, welcome to FOMO Sapiens. Hey, Patrick. I'm happy to be here. What's up? It's about to be a lot because we're going to cover a lot of ground today. But before we get there, I want to ask you, everybody feels a little FOMO sometimes. So what turns you into a FOMO Sapiens? So lately, it's seasons because I spent my whole life either in South Florida or I've now been in Los Angeles and I have been so FOMO when people post, they're like, oh, it's turning fall and here's the leaves. And I'm like, I've never lived through 
a season of seasons. I've never had that experience of season. So I really want that. All right. So I hate to contribute to your feelings of FOMO, but I got to confess today is the kind of day in New York that is the ultimate pumpkin spice latte kind of day. So I'm going to switch topics quickly. Kathy, the reason I wanted to have you on the show today is that you've spent your life helping people to decide what they're going to do with their lives through your podcast and your new book. So to get started, tell us, what is the big idea behind Don't Keep Your Day Job? The opposite of depression isn't happiness. I think it's a sense of purpose. And I think purpose comes from feeling like you're contributing to the world and that you're also, you have a sense of like belonging. And so when I came up with the idea of don't keep your day job, I was on this quest to help people feel like they lived their life on their terms where what if you really could do the thing that lights you up and then feel like you're contributing that thing to the world? And I've actually had the pleasure of being on your show. And as regular listeners to FOMO Sapiens know, I'm a big believer in the idea that we can all think about what we want to do with our lives and then find creative and clever ways to do those things. Maybe starting on the side, as I wrote about in The 10% Entrepreneur, but then potentially even going full time. And so what I like about the book is that you talk about side hustles and getting started on the side, especially in a world of creative entrepreneurs, which is where you live. You're a songwriter. You started out there. And now you're able to do all these other things. So talk about some of the steps to figuring out how you can actually get going as a creative entrepreneur or an entrepreneur in general on your path to finding the big project or the new career that you want to pursue. I love that question because I actually have an answer and there was a time, you know, I'm 40. There was a time where I did not know the answer to that question. And that is so much of reason why I want to do what I do because I want to give people that answer. Like, what are the steps? The first thing that's really fascinating is, you know, we had you on my show, which I loved having you on. We've had a lot of other awesome people, like just such smart folks. And we had Angela Duckworth on the podcast and she wrote a book called Grit. And she told me it's two thirds of the people in this world don't even know what they want to do. So it starts with a a discovery of like, what is this thing? And so it starts with getting back in touch with being curious and having some wonder and maybe making a list of like, well, I guess if I could just not have to be quote unquote practical, what would I write down of like five imaginary lives? And maybe you are surprised, but maybe you write down potter or floral designer or yoga teacher. Maybe then you could decide that you would dip your toe into one or two of those things. Like maybe you're not sure if it's travel writing or if it's opening a bakery, but maybe you take a pastry class and see how it feels to actually make some pastries. Or maybe you go on a trip to Santa Barbara and blog about it and just try to like take a little bit of an interest in yourself. I think that we've we really sort of put all that aside. I think people feel this pressure to know what they want to do for the rest of their lives when they're 18. And I think that that's ridiculous. I think that we keep evolving and you're probably going to change a few times and make some pivots. And a lot of successful people do that. They start out in one place and they keep listening to whatever this little curiosity is. So you would start there, but then let's say you already know. So you're at that stage now and you're trying to figure out, okay, so what do I do with that? You know, how do I make a living? So what's really important to understand is that at the heart of any successful endeavor, any successful business is radical empathy because a business and a hobby are different. A hobby means you can do whatever you want and you can just sort of have fun. A business means by definition that somebody is paying you, which means someone else needs the thing or wants the thing. And so they give you money, which means that right away you have to ask yourself, who is this for? Who am I serving? And most people build businesses backwards. They sit in their room in the laboratory by themselves coming up with something and then they put it out in the world and they try to convince people to want this thing. But if you look at successful people, successful enterprises, successful companies, whether it's Apple or Skippy Peanut Butter, the folks behind it are constantly in front of their audience and they're doing focus groups and they're testing and they're asking questions. And so we make things harder than they have to be because we don't begin with the person it's for. And then the third thing is we want to validate the idea, right? We want to test it. And then after that, you're learning how to scale it. And scaling it means figuring out where your audience already exists and how do you get in front of them. Those are the basic pieces. It's what do you want to do? Who is it for? Validate the idea and then scale that. 
Yeah, and I want to comment on that a little bit because you were keen to two things that I think a lot about when it comes to entrepreneurship. The first is the idea that, you know, we all have this dream that we want to pursue, but you don't actually really know if you want to do that thing. I remember reading an article in the New York Times about a woman who's a corporate lawyer, and her dream was to sell her grandmother's cookies. So she decided that she would quit her job as a lawyer and start baking. And so she did. She quit her job. She got this baking space. She started baking all the time. And what she realized in the process is that being a baker is back-breaking work. No more fancy offices. She was always sick because of the, the climate and where she was working. And she sat around and after about a year realized that she was daydreaming about working back at the law firm. And, and that's, that's pretty ironic and it's a terrible place to end up. So you need to go through the process of trying this thing that you think you want to do to see if you even like doing it all the time. The second thing that you keyed into, which I think is really important, is that building a business doesn't happen sitting at a desk. You need to get out, talk to customers, explore sales channels, get out into the world, step out of your comfort zone. And, and as you do so, you will learn so much that it will help you to be more successful. And so you, Kathy, have done this for yourself. You've had great success as a songwriter and a podcaster, now an author. What do you think you have done correctly? And what have you learned along the way that has been able to help you to thrive in your new career? What I've noticed is that every human being I know has a great idea and what they're missing is momentum. And the momentum comes from doing the outreach. Remember when I talked about how you have to know this idea of what you want to do and then you get in front of people? So most people are so afraid to be messy and they overthink it and they're scared and they don't know what they have to offer. So they don't even begin to put things out in the world until they have them quote unquote finished or ready, which they never, never are. Successful people start. I think what comes here is a lot of just sort of imposter syndrome because there's people who have less talent than everyone who's listening right now, but they're doing great things. And it's because they gave themselves permission to do mediocre things and get them out in the world in order to get the momentum and to, and to figure out who it is for and to do a lot of testing and to, and to start to get relationships going and, and start planting those seeds. So I think for me as a musician... I got dropped from a record label. I was like, oh, I guess I'll never be a musician. And then I thought, wait, what if I could write music for ads and TV shows? And so I started doing cold calls and calling ad agencies and networks like Paramount and Lionsgate and finding out who the person was who chose music. And I had to send them songs that weren't right at first until I could figure out what they did need. And I had to talk to them with empathy before I ask them for anything and really seek to solve a problem and to make friends with them and to talk in a personable way and send emails that were not businessy so that they would actually respond. And all of that led to real fluidity in terms of making connections. And those connections led to the answers of how I could serve. And then I was really willing to to help serve that way. And when I couldn't, when I said, no, you know, actually I don't have a hip hop track. I only write this kind of thing. I would be happy to introduce them to someone who could. Like I was still in it for how can I help solve the problem? Um, and, and when you're doing that every single day and you're taking that kind of action, huge things happen. So Kathy, both the book and the podcast are called Don't Keep Your Day Job. But obviously, if you're starting on the side, you're going to keep your day job for at least a period of time. And a question that I often encounter talking to people in this space of part-time entrepreneurship is, okay, great. I start this business, start selling, I get some traction. Maybe I get to the point where I'm actually too busy. I can't do it all. I'm trying to figure out, you know, how do I choose between this, this part-time project and my day job? So how do you know when you're at the point that you could actually go ahead and go full time? I think that there are certain benchmarks that you need to hit. All of the things that I just said that need to happen from like that discovery process of what you even like to figuring out who you're serving and, and who it's for and what they need and validating this idea, all of that's going to take time. And you can do all of that while you have your day job. And once you get these benchmarks where you're starting to see the sales and you're starting to say, you know what, if I had more free time, I would just do more of that, then it's time. You've started making sales. You've started to have that. That's, a, that's feedback from the universe. The sale is feedback that you have figured out what it is and who it's for, and you've gotten some of that legwork done of what they want. And that's when I would think about leaving and then knowing what to do. Because a lot of times people will quit and then they actually set themselves up to fail because they don't have all of those steps done. They put then a tremendous amount of pressure 
to, to figure it out right away, which it's going to take a little time to develop and they'll go back to a job because they'll be like, oh, forget it. I don't even know where to start. We have a ceiling. We all have a ceiling in our mind of like what's possible. And part of the reason I like to do my show and part of the reason I wrote this book is I want to show people actual examples of human beings who built a career doing something they love because I think it's very easy to say to yourself, well, when I was in fourth grade, we had a career day and it was either be a lawyer, be a veterinarian, you know, be an accountant. There's so many things that are possible. And so part of it is understanding that the way that your brain works, your brain was created just to protect you and look for problems. So most people are going to worry and most people are going to find problems every day and like you're going to be wired sort of for negativity and it doesn't mean there's anything wrong with you. It's just the way your brain works. But if you know that, then you'll understand that you have to feed yourself every single morning, whatever lights you up. Because we've all had moments where we feel super bold and super fierce and high energy and ready to take on the world that's the place that we have to take this action from because this is really high stakes. Like we're talking about what do you want to do with your life? And what we do to protect ourselves is say, I'm not going to put myself out there unless I know for sure things will work out, unless I know for sure it's a done deal. Like I don't want to be vulnerable to be rejected. I don't want to be vulnerable to put out this thing that I desire and and not be met we've used it as a survival skill. Yes. And the ironic thing is we think that people who are successful in one part of their lives, you know, they've got the big job, they're working at the at the bank or the law firm or whatever it is with the corner office, that when they go out to do something else, that they're automatically going to be successful. But the reality is you may be very successful in what you're doing, but when you step outside of your comfort zone and do something completely different, it's disorienting. So you're used to having those scheduled days, all the people working with you, you kind of know what you you need to do to succeed. And then all of a sudden you walk into that empty office, you, you know, you incorporated and you don't even know how to fill your day. And it, it can be very, very stressful and difficult. And so one of the critical things to remember is that people get comfortable and breaking out of their comfort zone is very rare and very hard to do. Of course, here's the, the, the good news is that once you get started, make some mistakes and you realize that by making mistakes, you're not going to keel over and die. Something happens, something changed. And actually taking new risks, trying new things becomes addictive and you get the confidence to take these risks and maybe even feel a little audacious because you realize that as you try new things and you build confidence, the ROI, the return on investment on your time increases. And that's the point where maybe you think, you know what, I'm going to do this full time. A friend of mine, she says, rejection is just redirection. Everyone is mediocre at first at everything. And that's the way that it goes. That's why when I think of people who are really successful, Serena Williams, Elon Musk, these are people who have the courage to fail and wade their way through mediocrity until they write the best song, until they win the game, right? Like there's there's a willingness to allow themselves the grace to not need to be perfect right away. Because if you need that, you'll never actually be great. You'll never become great at anything, right? And I also think that there are things inside of us that we've always wanted to put in the world. There's there's just some things that we know we have to do and we have to make. And so the reward isn't being the best in the world or making the most money from it. The reward is like, you showed up. I completely agree. And what I see sometimes, and this surprised me in the beginning, but I see it more and more, is that there are some people that say, listen, I'm doing this thing on the side and you know what? I'm not going to be able to go full time. I didn't have the level of success that I would need to be able to actually quit my day job, but it doesn't matter because you know what? Being able to do this thing on the side makes everything else worth it because my day job funds this activity and I love it and it really puts meaning into my life. I think that we live in a really interesting world where people voluntarily choose to spend most of their time doing things they don't like. It's kind of fascinating because we we can choose. There's an expansiveness to what's possible and we can create a new possibility that maybe we don't have to save up our happiness for the weekends and retirement. Like maybe there's a way for you to be a part of this thing you love in just a more creative way. Maybe you're not going to have a record deal, but you can still write music. Maybe you're not going to become Mrs. Fields, but you're going to start teaching people courses online on how to bake the best cookies. There's just so much that is possible. 
So if you take this approach, you are scoping out a life or designing a life where there could be tons of different outcomes, right? You could end up, say you want to be a, a, a singer-songwriter. You could be, be a very famous person. You could be on TV. You could be at the top of the charts. Or you could just end up singing every year at your family's holiday party. Both are completely possible, and both could, in the end, be very fulfilling. But do you think it's a good idea to have a goal up front, or is it better to go into this with an open mind and not necessarily set some audacious goal to begin with? I say open, open, open mind because whenever I've talked to someone who tells me their three-year, five-year plan, I know that they're thinking too small because we only see right now, like if you look down the block, you can only see as far as you can see from where you're standing. So as you evolve and you, it's sort of like a scavenger hunt, like you'll have this idea. I mean, you have a similar story in your own life, but Jonathan Adler was on my podcast. He's a very famous designer. He had this idea to go to Peru and he went to Peru and he met this couple that does all this like threading and he started to make pillows and then he started to work with them and then he came back to New York City and the pillows led him to the next thing. And now he's, I mean, his, his life now is designing hotels. He has 28 flagship stores. He's sold in all the fancy department stores. He has a multi, multi, multi million dollar business, which started with this. I don't know what I want to do. When he graduated from Brown, he said, I don't know, maybe I'll go to Santa Fe and weave baskets. Like he didn't know what he wanted to do. But what I find that sort of the outliers have, I had Adam Grant on my podcast and we talked about people who are original and who really like get sort of the greatest of what life has to offer. It's this not knowing and this willingness to trust the curiosity. I think that what happens, and I think everyone who's listening has experienced this at some point, there are things in your life when you trust your curiosity or this whisper, whatever it is, and you, you follow it, there's a synchronicity that shows up that almost feels like religious. It's crazy. Definitely stay open. Like, what's possible? I don't know. And keep practicing that muscle. Like, every day, open a Google Doc and like dump out, brain dump 30 bad ideas get in the habit of coming up with ideas, ideate, ideate, come up with ideas. Who could you call? What might she say? Oh no, you know what I should do? I really want to do this. Oh, who's it for? Maybe this person. Until you start to go, no, I'm getting it. I'm gathering it. This is really what the thing is. And then as you do that, your career will literally just take you in places you couldn't believe it did. Yeah, I have this thing on my phone. I'm a list maker and I have lists for everything uh, in my life on the Reminders app on the iPhone. And I come up with new ideas all the time. In fact, right now I'm kind of trying to come up with a couple new words. I have three new words I'm working on, so look out world. And that's a really great way to store your ideas because here's what happens. You come up with an idea, you jot it down, and maybe on day one you think, well, this isn't a very good idea, but you go back to it on day five or day 10 or day 33 or day 172, and you look at it differently and you start thinking, yeah, it's not a bad idea at all. And that can actually turn into things. It's happened with me all the time, writing my books, writing things down that a year or two later I come back to and it ends up being an idea that I would have never remembered and that is actually pretty useful. So having a repository of the things you're thinking about so you can go back and look at them is a very good idea. Kathy, this is the show about how to find the power to choose what you actually want and the courage to miss out on the rest. So what advice do you have for our listeners? I mean, I just feel like every one of us has this like six-year-old inside of us who has been on the, like waiting on the sidelines way too long. And I think most people, this idea of like become who you're supposed to be, it's really like unbecome because so many of the things we do are the things we do because other people told us to. So it's really like choose yourself because I think the number one regret of the dying is that people didn't feel like they lived their life. Like I would have gone to art school, but my mom told me not to. Oh, I would have been this, but it didn't seem realistic or I didn't want to let someone down or whatever. And that is the greatest, greatest tragedy. So I think that the number one human need is to feel seen. Like we want people to get us, but I think that we want to see ourselves. I think that the person that you're looking for is you. Like you want to come home to yourself. So that's the greatest fulfillment is like whether this thing becomes monetized or not is like, did you 
crack open back to this thing that just feels like you. And then even if you don't monetize it, like how does that just change the way you feel in your skin? How does that change your marriage? How does that change your friendships? How does that make things just so much more alive when you're coming from this place of this is what really makes me happy? And I think just asking yourself that question and going down the path of that curiosity, like I definitely have seen it over and over that it can lead to a huge career. And at the very least, it just leads to so much more knowing of yourself and maybe finding things that you were supposed to do that other people in your community in this world needed that only you could offer. And I think that's what we're chasing. A couple of weeks ago, I had Dr. David Fagerman on the show talking about his life experience and his story is, is incredible. If you haven't heard it, go back and listen. He was given last rites five times before the age of 30 before he used his own training in, in medical school and in an MBA program to find his own treatment. And what he told me, which really stuck with me, is that we don't regret the things we did do. We regret the things we didn't do. And he has this whole sort of life philosophy called think and do it. And he just says, if you want to do something, if it comes into your mind, then you should go for it. And I think that that can be very powerful. Wait, what a powerful, powerful person. Kathy, you got a lot going on. Obviously, you're a singer-songwriter. You've got a podcast and the book coming out. You've got a family. You've been building an empire here. So as you do that, what do you feel like you're missing out on? I've built this beautiful life, you know, three kids. I had to go all the fertility treatments to, to have each one. And I worked so hard, came out to LA with nothing, right? Like no emotional support from my parents, no financial support. I built this incredible seven-figure income doing something I love. And then I turn around and I go become a workaholic. So how is that helping anyone? Like I built a career so that I could take off time in the afternoon. Like I've set it up this way and I miss out on taking walks and naps and reading books for fun and having lunch with my girlfriends or going to, you know, do a wine tasting. I miss out on that for no good reason. So I've been trying to train myself to enjoy what I have. And it's interesting. I think some people are really good at earning money. And there's a difference between like, you could be so good at making money, which that seems to be something like through the course of like knowing empathy and knowing how to do outreach and be messy. Like I'm pretty good at making money because I get people and I get out there and I'm scrappy, but having means just enjoying it. Right. And I think that that comes down to my own like self-worth. Like I think I have this thing where like, I have to like prove it to myself over and over and over again. It gets dumb. I don't have to do that in this moment. I could afford to take a lot more walks and chill. And so I'm really, really working on that. And I hope that that is something that I start to do more of is just like life, just enjoy it, you know, more. Yes. And I think this is something a lot of people who've worked for themselves can relate to. I certainly struggle with it. When I left the corporate world and you know, you're in the corporate world and you go to the office from nine to whenever, and you have a pretty fixed schedule, you know where you're going to be and what you're going to be doing. And then when you work for yourself and you have these blocks of time that are open, you could theoretically go for a run. You could go for a walk. You could go take a French class, but somehow you don't want to give yourself permission to do it. It feels like I'm not working hard enough or I'm wasting my time. And I got to tell you, I have have a solution for that. I put it in the calendar. I take French every week. It's on the calendar and I go. I put runs in the, the calendar. I, I just try to make sure that I give myself permission to use my time as I want to because that's the whole point of working for yourself is that you control your schedule. It really is a thing, Patrick, by the way, is becoming a workaholic because people tell you you're crushing it. If I was drinking all day long, no one would tell me I'm crushing it. But the more I work and the more successful, people would go more, double down, triple exit. It's like, Working a lot is also an escape. I'm trying to figure that out and like just do less. You know, it's a very fine line between being type A and what I like to call being type cray. That's one of the three words I'm working on. Hopefully it's not taken yet. Kathy, it's been great having you on. For the listeners who want to check out your podcast, check out your book and everything you're doing, where can they find out more about you? You can find the podcast wherever you listen to podcasts. Apple Podcasts is great or wherever you listen. And you can find the book if you go to Barnes & Noble or Amazon. But if you go to don'tkeepyourdayjob.com slash book, 
We are giving away so many cool bonuses just for buying the book. There's like a workshop I'm giving live, not a taped video, but like a workshop I'm giving live on how to quit your day job. There's like a booklet that comes with it. We're doing uh, like an Ask Me Anything 90-minute Q&A session. There's just a bunch of bonuses we're giving away. So if you're going to buy the book, you may as well go to don'tkeepyourdigital.com slash book and it'll let you buy it from any place, uh, but it'll let you also put in your information so you can get all the goodies. Well done. And when you're out there checking out Kathy's podcast, make sure to give her five stars. And while you're in the app, maybe head over to FOMO Sapiens and consider giving me five stars as well. Yeah. And listen to Patrick's episode on the Don't Keep Your Day Job podcast. That's a good place to start. Yeah, definitely check it out. We had a great conversation. Kathy, thanks so much for stopping by today. Best of luck. And we look forward to see what you do next. Amazing. Thank you so much for such a fun, fun talk. FOMO. Big news. We now have a brand new website. So head over to FOMOSapiens.com where you can listen to past episodes, learn more about the show, and find out how to advertise. Also, head over to Spotify where you can find and follow playlists of the best of the show. You can also connect with me on Instagram at Patrick J. McGinnis, on Twitter at PJ McGinnis, and on LinkedIn. I'd love to hear from you, so don't be shy. FOMO Sapiens is recorded in New York City. Theme music is by Mike McGinnis, and editing and post-production is by Josh Elstrom. If you like today's show, please be sure to rate it and recommend it to your friends. And as always, you can find me at FOMOSapiens.com and at PatrickMcGinnis.com. To advertise on FOMO Sapiens, reach out to contact at FOMOSapiens.com. FOMO. FOMO.